Hey, this is Molly Rennick from Living Dead Girl. I'm Jeremy Saffer, rock photographer. Hey, this is Buzz Black. Hey guys, this is John Karabi. Hey there, this is Ron Wasserman, the nut that wrote Go Go Power Rangers. Hi, this is Mike Aloisi, also known as Author Mike. I am a biographer and writer, and you are watching the Chronicles of Podcast with Tom Stevens and Jamie Westwood. Hey guys, what's going on? It's the Chronicles of Podcast. We're back once again with the 72nd edition, Jamie. 72nd? Crazy. I do, but it's, it is, it is a little bit nuts, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, I do believe the these Chronicles right here, these Chronicles this week, this one that's around this right it's around this now it's around us today are the chronicles of michael aloisi yeah they are wonderful i like this a lot it's good we'll get the hang of it now know, you know right? so take, so take a 72 editions um but anyway let's get to it hit it so jamie oh. um should we oh. uh should we bring them in oh go on, piece in? go on welcome to the chronicles of Michael Aloisi. Michael Aloisi is an incredible author. He's written books and stories all from his own mind, like Mr. Blue Stick, 50 Handfuls, and so many more. Not only that, he's worked with some incredible people like Kane Hodder, Tom Savini, to write their biographies. This is an incredible, incredible conversation. This is top tier. We had so much fun doing this. You're going to love it. It is very much out the blue how great this is. Yeah. So, yeah, if you expected horror stories, think again, people. Jamie! Yes, sir. Do you supposedly have any final words? Just a massive thank you to our wonderful guest. Thank you for coming on, spending time with us. This is so much fun. And everyone, enjoy it. Absolutely, Michael. Thank you for taking the time to speak to us. We enjoyed it thoroughly, and we're so excited to bestow it upon the world. Ladies and gentlemen, here we Go! Ladies and gentlemen, interviewing this week, it's Michael Aloisi! Yeah! Hey there! There he is! Michael! How you doing? You okay? Good, how are you? (laughs) Yeah, very well, sorry. I was literally singing your name before you turned up. I don't know why. Um, I think, I don't know if it's a British thing, I'm not entirely sure, but I was literally just going... Michael Eloise. I was quite like it. It really worked. I should hire you to introduce me for everything and be like, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Eloise. Um, yeah, sorry, I'll stop. I was actually um, going to confirm I'm... the pronunciation of the surname, but as he smashed it, I don't need to. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. I'm enjoying the uh, the flashing uh, Funko Pops behind you. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Those That's are my... awesome. Childhood ones, the horror ones are everywhere else, all over the place. But yeah, nice, beautiful, Michael. Thank you so much, my friend, for doing this. I really appreciate. Well, we really appreciate you even. Sorry, Jamie. Um, <laughs> I appreciate this. This is uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Basically, what we do is um, Jamie's going to do like a nice little introduction, make you feel quite at home, lure you in with that, that false sense of security, and then we're going to absolutely bombard the living hell out of your questions. How does that sound? Sounds good. I like it. I like it. Mag- Magnif. Shall I do my intro? Yes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, today we bring you another wonderful guest who has dedicated his life to telling stories, whether they be his own, from his own beautiful mind, or from the stories of others. This man is an author, a publisher, and just so happens to be good friends with a serial killer. That statement will make more sense as we go on, I promise. Everyone, please join me as we bring you the Chronicles of Michael Aloisi. Hello there. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining yeah. us, sir. Yes. Absolutely. How was uh, how was your holiday season, Michael? Did you have a good Christmas and New Year? Good, good. Yeah, my my wife got COVID the day before <laughs> Christmas, so it kind of kind of threw everything off a little bit. But you know, we <laughs> were, were able to you know get it done like a week later. But but it was nice. That's rubbish. I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah she was horrible. Could have been all right. Should... Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. She true. was fine. I was just. She's had a sniffle, but you know we had to keep her keep her away from the kids. You know, <laughs> stay away. <laughs> yeah, like, <come> back. <laughs> no outbreaks um, here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which leads me quite beautifully, actually, into how was your pandemic season? I know, obviously, it's still here, but like, it's not as rife as it was. You know, honestly, as a writer, pandemic was nice for me because then you know I just got to stay home and 
and sit at my computer and, and do stuff. Although I did not get nearly as much writing done as I thought I would, because it's one of those things where it's like, oh, I have so much time. I'm going to get stuff done. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, crap, I didn't do anything, you know, like that kind of thing. But, <laughs> but it was nice, you know, because no one I knew got sick or had anything horrible. And so it was just kind of a, you know, a nice year home of just, you know, doing housework and, you know, getting stuff done. So, so it was decent. Yeah. Good I love that. It's like, I've got plenty of time. I'll start Monday. Yeah. Nah, yeah, I've exactly. still got yeah. loads more time. I'll start next Monday. It's fine. Yep. That's what it is. Over and over again. That's what it was. I'm like, oh, I'm going to write this today. I'm going to do this. And then I'm like, oh, I did this. And around the house and, and nothing. Yep. Maybe one. So take us back, sir, to the days when you were a young boy. What did a young master Aloisi want to be when he was growing up? Was it always in the world of writing or something completely different? No, actually, if you told a young me I was going to be a writer... I would have laughed and never believed it. Um, I struggled with reading. Um, I never liked to read. You would have to tape my eyes open to read as a kid. Um, <laughs> and so it wasn't my cup of tea. Um, but growing up, I, I changed what I wanted to be like every other week. And when I got older, I actually had a, a teacher. We had like a career development class in high school that was helping to figure out what you want to do. And I explained, she's like, what do you love? And I'm like, well, movies. And she helped me realize that every time I wanted to be a different thing, like one week I want to be FBI agent, one week I want to be this. And it was because it was the movie, whatever movie I was in love with at that time was was what I wanted to be. And so she's like, well, why don't you just uh, go to school for movies? And I was like, that's a thing we can do? You know, because back, <laughs> back in the 90s, I didn't realize that was like, you know, a possibility. Now every single kid in the world has cameras and is a filmmaker. Um, and so I was oh, like, yeah. hmm. Interesting. So I went to school for to make movies, um, <clears throat> and slowly as I was make uh, you know in film school, I loved it. But I realized I didn't love the technical aspect. Like you know, I didn't have to, like having to get the camera lens and figure out the lighting and angles and all these things. And I realized that I was helping everyone with their stories and the writing and all that kind of stuff. And so when I graduated, I kind of transitioned over to to writing. Um, I thought I was going to write screenplays, uh, but then I got stuck writing my first screenplay. And I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll write this out as a story. It'll help me flesh it out. And so I started writing it as a book and never went back from there. I just kept writing from there and went back and got my master's. Actually, I got my master's in England um, oh. over there. Yep. And uh, and been doing it ever since. That's amazing. I love how you went following one passion went, actually, now I'm going to turn a corner. I like this a bit more. Exactly. Yeah, well, that passion led to, you know, led me to the true passion. But then I, but I, but I mix in the movies by all the things I do. You know, I still work with movie related things, which is cool. That's absolutely I think it's, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? When you're like a teenager growing up into like a young adolescent to be like, what do you want to do with your life? Um, yeah, exactly. I yeah. don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I teach filmmaking um to high schoolers and it's it's funny because when it comes time for applying to colleges so many kids you know they they get that pressure of you know what are you gonna do what do you, you have to pick a degree you have to pick a school you have to pick a school and so many of them are like just they have no clue you know and there's so few degrees that are just general degrees you know they're like oh you shouldn't get yeah. a general degree because then it doesn't and so they're all like that panic they're like what do i do you know <laughs> yeah. i'll go here be fine <laughs> yeah like i have to decide my whole life right now you know <laughs> I, I don't want to be a doctor but i'm going to medical school it, it's, it's something so there you go <laughs> yeah the thing that makes me laugh at that as well is you know you go into education to learn how to do something but you don't really know if you're going to enjoy it because i went yeah, to exactly, college yeah. to study to be a chef i did a year working as a chef and i was like this is the worst decision of my life <laughs> get me out of here yeah that's what's funny because i i thought i wanted to be a cook at, at one point and i worked in a restaurant as a teenager and I loved it, but then by the time I was like 16, 17, I realized I hadn't been home on a holiday for, for four years. And I was like 17, you know, I'm like, I haven't been home for Thanksgiving, for New Year's, for any, because we had to work every holiday. I smelled like fish every day when I came home, you oh. know, worked every weekend. And I was like, I'm 17 and, and I'm already cranky about this. Maybe I shouldn't do it being a cook, you know. <laughs> yeah. But I still love cooking, just just not for, you know, not for a living. Just at home. The rest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So one thing I've always admired writers for is their ability to like have an idea and then be able to translate that into a story on the page. It's something my brain just will not allow me to do. Did that come like natural to you of learning, or was that something you had to like really focus on and teach yourself? Um, for me, that that's just it's just natural, just the way it happens. Um, like I didn't realize 
like growing up, I used to just write down stories, having no clue I was being a writer or wanted to be a writer, but I would just be so bored in someone's class, like a teacher's class, that I would just write a story to tell myself because I was bored. Uh, so looking back, I'm like, oh, I was writing back then, but it didn't, con- you know, there was no concept. But for me, it's, I start with like one line and like, like, and then it just, it just comes out nonstop, you know, comes out until it's done. You know, I'm not one of those writers who uh, have like a, you know, a big board with all the, the written out plot points and all these things. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm, I'm like Stephen King has in his book, he talks about it. It's a, like a fossil to where you just have like a little tip of something poking out and you're like, Ooh, that's an idea. And you just keep on, un, un, you know, unearthing it. And so you get it out and you're like, ah, that's a, this dinosaur, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> that's so cool. Me, it just, yeah. It just kind of always just comes out kind of thing. So, yeah. I love, I love the idea of you sitting there going like, and then he got out the knife. It could be his mother. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it is what, as I'm, when I'm writing, it, it's literally like one of the most enjoyable things to me writing. Cause it's like watching a movie that I'm part of. Because I'll sit there and also like, oh my god, I didn't know that was going to happen. You know, I'm like, oh, wow. you know, and I keep typing. And I'm like, this is so exciting. And then I'll run to my like my wife or somebody. I'm like, you don't understand. I just did. And they're just like, okay. You know, like they don't get it because I'm like, yeah, but it's so cool. You know, my brain yeah. is amazing. Why don't you appreciate it? Exactly. I'm like, this was genius. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like you need to appreciate this more. <laughs> So you said you studied film and then went to do your master's in it. What did you do your master's in? Uh, it's a master's in creative writing. So it's an MFA, which is higher than an MA, which uh-huh. that's at least that's how they pitched it to us. I don't even know what the difference is, but yeah, <laughs> yeah creative writing. So it meant that we, we went to uh, uh, an abbey in a thousand year old abbey in the middle of a, a tiny town where I still had thatched roofs. And so we had this giant like mansion. And we would sit there next to a fireplace that was taller than me, and everyone would drink wine and eat cheese all night and talk about uh, books. Of course, I don't drink, so I just ate the cheese. But that was the the master's program, which was, was really kind of a cool experience, you know. I, saw, I mean, I'd be there for the cheese, like screw the yeah, right. Exactly. It's like, <laughs> yeah, Every what, night. watch. <laughs> Is it coming bad tonight, darling? Lovely, lovely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So what I could tell from my research, your first published work was Mr. Blue Stick. Is that right? Uh, close. That was my second one. 50 Handfuls was my first one. Okay. The timeline, I, yeah. I got the timeline completely wrong. With. Well, no, that's fine. They're, they were close. They were close together. Yeah. <laughs> so 50 Handfuls, did you say? Sorry. Yep. So was that the first story that you'd written or was that just the first one that was published? Uh, it was the first one that I, I wrote that was a full length thing. That was the, the script I was trying to write, this, that script. And I was so stuck and so stuck that I was like, I'm going to write it out. And it just became uh, a weepy drama, which is, you know, now I'm 80% horror What is what I do. But when I was just writing that, it was just the story that was stuck in my head that I wanted to write. And and that's what came out was a, a weepy drama, which which everyone still loves, you know, the people who have read it and stuff. So, which is good. Actually, it just, um, it just got picked up to be translated uh, into Danish. I think that's the language. What do they speak in? In uh, wow, I am I'm good at pitching my own stuff here. Holy <laughs> cow! What do they speak in Denmark? Belgium? Belgium? Denmark? Oh. Yeah, Denmark. Belgium? Yeah, Denmark. Danish. Danish. Yeah, Belgium yeah, Danish. is yeah. Belgian. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and then De- yeah, Denmark's Danish. Yeah, so so they're just getting translated into Danish. That one and Mister Bluestick are both um getting translated into Danish in uh in the end of this year and then early next year they will come out so yeah that's which awesome, is cool. awesome. i love yeah i really love the look of pieces i was reading the uh the little blurby bit about pieces and i quite like the idea of it so i'm actually quite tempted there to pick go. that bad boy up um yeah, i like the idea favorite. of like serial killer that sent let's chop to 30 pieces 30 boxes 18 yep. founders right? yeah 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 yep. yeah, yeah so serial killer mean, kidnaps girl ripped. cuts her up pieces mails it around the world, uh, country to random places and then 18 are turned into the police immediately, and then 12 aren't. And then um, the book is basically um, about the 12 pieces that weren't turned in. And so the kind of short stories about like the like why these people didn't turn in these body parts, um, and that mixed with like a through line of the serial killer and a reporter that he's taunting. Um, and I wrote that oh. with Rebecca Rowland, who's uh, an amazing horror writer who's done really well and stuff. So yeah, it's it's one of my favorite books because I think it's the best. My best writing because she pushed me to do uh, to write better, and um, I think it's really kind of fun and interesting. I love the concept of just you get a body part in the mail. What do you do? You know that kind of thing. 
I wonder what I'd do. I'm just thinking, what, exactly. would I do? what would you do? Yeah. <laughs> Scream. The normal right? person would call the call, but like, uh, excuse me, please. <laughs> but, but the people in the book don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> and where does the name Author Mike? Because if fans know you as Author Mike, I, I'm, I'm, I've got do. a feeling yeah. I know where this is going. But <laughs> it, it's, <laughs> it's mostly because my last name, no one can pronounce it. Um, <laughs> and so when I was first starting to do writing, I was like, well, I don't want to put Aloisi you know, dot com or, or this and that. And so when I was picking a website, I was like, I need something that's easy to say to people. And so it just came as author Mike and it kind of can became a brand now. And so so it works. That's awesome. But you've you've got three books under Michael Gore. Yes. Yep. So those so what... those are my creepier, gory short stories, which which the stuff oh, okay. I love to write. Um but it's under Michael Gore because uh, because of the first couple of books, the Mr. Blue Stick and the Fifty Handfuls and White Ash um, had a very strong middle-aged women fan base. And I didn't want them picking this up going, oh, it's another book by him. You know, <laughs> freaking out, you know, and be like, like, what the heck is this? You know, so so that's my my area where I do kind of really gory, gross things and stuff. Yeah. Oh, fair play. You're actually looking out for your fans. That's, that's awesome. I try. You know, I try. <laughs> It's funny because when I was reading like some of the Amazon reviews on some of your books, there was quite a few that were like, "Oh, me and my friends read this in book club and we absolutely loved it." <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the those are the fifty handfuls, Mister Blue Sick ones. Yeah, there's not many horror book clubs, which kind of makes me sad. I wish there was more, you know, because there's not many horror fans sitting around going, "Let's read this together," you know. Unfortunately, we should make it awesome. right. I never really Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Should I actually get? Yeah. They'd be like, "Have you read Arthur Max books or Michael Gore? Either or, you've, you've got to read them." Yeah, like, have you read these? Yeah, <laughs> I like the one where the skin starts pulling off, and I. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, so, where do you get your ideas for your stories? Because obviously, you said you've done like a horror. There's a, people, books appealing to middle aged women, all sorts of different sort of stories. Where do you get your ideas from? Is so my brain is weird um it's <laughs> constantly it's constantly like paranoia um and just i think a childhood of not having friends and watching a lot of television um to where ev every single thing is just a story to me to where like you know my wife and people who know me get annoyed because i'll look at something like everywhere I, you know go out somewhere and i'll look and i go there's a bag someone left a bag over there <laughs> i bet you there's severed hand in it you know just like just random you know like whatever and then like what are you talking about the freaking bag and then you know someone picks it up i go oh i go my idea was better you know then then, then that's <laughs> you know? so yeah so it's just literally i have a list of i have a file with over 280 story ideas that are in it because wow. every day there's something I'm like ooh, what if that happens i mean most of them are just a sentence or two you know but they're literally just i look at something i go ooh, what is that and then i think about something like mr blue stick um which is about uh, a little girl who um, has an imaginary friend and then it ends as she disappears and everyone realizes that it wasn't an imaginary friend. Um, that mm -hmm. was started. Yeah. Creepy. Uh, it's not a really scary story. <laughs> that, was drama. Um, that started, I was on a train um, cause I'm from Massachusetts and I lived in New York at the time and I was going back to New York and I'm just sitting there. It's nighttime and I'm looking out the window and I saw a bright blue light in the middle of the woods. And I was just like, the hell was that? And so I just wrote an entire book about what that blue light was in the woods. I mean, just a, a split second thing I saw, but it was something that stuck in my head. I'm like, I can't figure out what that was. It was. So, you know, a whole book comes from a, a split second thing like that. So Wow. So yeah. where, did, where did the horror, the love of horror come from? Then? Was that movies growing up? That, that was growing up. I mean, when I was young, I was petrified of horror movies. Like to where like, and I, I remember it was kind of a weird thing. I remember being like six or seven and seeing a Guns N' Roses poster and being like, oh, freaking out. Because it was skulls. Because it was like, oh, yeah. like a oh, skull sure. and like yeah. guns. And so I was like, oh, that must be scary. You know, <laughs> like looking back now, I'm like, oh, that was stupid. But I was petrified of horror. Um, and then I went over a friend's house. And I want to say when I was like, like 13 and his friend's mom rented Friday 13th Part 3. And I was like freaking out. So I sat on the couch way back with like a pillow and I'm like acting like, you know, it's no big deal. And then as I started watching it, I'm like, boobs. All right. You know, I got like you know, I got a little closer and I'm like, this is kind of cool. And it became, it opened this door of like, wow, this is really cool. You know? And so it just became this obsession to where by the time I was like 16, 17, my whole room was, you know, all horror posters <laughs> and 
you know, and figurines and stuff like that. And it's been a lifelong obsession. Like I can't turn my computer, but if you have a life-size Frankenstein over there, I got monsters everywhere and hockey masks Ooh. and all kinds of stuff. Oh, you can see him behind me, the little zombie and stuff and all the stuff everywhere. But yeah, so it just became a, a lifelong of, um, love of, of horror movies and horror stuff. I, just I love the answer was essentially yeah. boobs. Boobs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, ooh, boobs. <laughs> That's what that's what got me go. Wait a minute! All right, I'll look at this. I'll watch this. <laughs> <laughs> I can put it with blood and gore for boobs. Come on, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> win, absolute win. <laughs> as, as I said in my intro, you've not only released your own stories, but you've worked with other people to tell their stories. The one yep. of the books that really stood out to me, and that was Arm Candy. Because yes. I'll be honest, I wasn't 100% sure if this was a true story. Is these real stories? This is re- all real happened. Yeah, so Arm Candy, I co-wrote with uh, Chris Guida. And so his his job was a unique Hollywood job to where he was a, a celebrity escort. Not the way you're thinking. He was <laughs> okay. an escort to where um, at like uh, the Academy Awards, the Golden Globes, like big fancy parties. He would meet the celebrities on the red carpet, bring them to where they're supposed to be for like their interviews, usher them to their seats, take them to the after parties. He would sit in their seat when they were up on the stage, you know, so he would escort them through all these parties. And so it was a a unique story about his crazy life of working with everyone, every different celebrity in the world and kind of the behind the scenes of this, this world of uh, award shows and stuff like that. Um, And so it was interesting because uh, big publishers wanted his book but all they wanted was to have dirty like gossip. And so he's like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm like, it's just, you know, I'm going to tell you what I saw, but I'm not going to just go and be like, and then I saw this guy do Coke over here. You know, it's like, <laughs> it was more of just about this career and these cool things he did and stuff. And so, um, so I ended up getting to, to write it with him and um, you know, it, it's an interesting story, uh, but it did huge for me. Cause it was on, um, it was on entertainment weekly. It was on the cover of uh, Vogue in Italy. It was on, uh, New York Post and the main thing. He was on like every single TV show. Ryan Seacrest did a whole thing about it on E News. I mean, it was a it was a big deal for me. So it was kind of cool getting it all over the world, seeing it and stuff. That's and awesome. it was weird though. So at the same time, being like, "That's I I did that." Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's yeah. cool. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, my name's not on the cover, which is fine because we co-wrote it. So it's on the inside, but it's still something I did. You know, all over the place. And yeah, yeah. yeah. Doesn't matter. It's still there, regardless if it's on the outside or inside or whatever. Exactly. It's still there. It's still your work. Yeah. How what's what's it like co-writing? Because I can't I can imagine it's either a lot of but what this, but this, but this, but this, but this. Well, like this idea. So there's different types of co-writing. I've only co-wrote with him, um, and then um with Rebecca. Rebecca and I have a good way of, of writing to where um we kind of take pieces of things and like you know, she does this part, I'll do this part, that kind of thing back and forth. Um, with him, he kind of wrote a draft and then I went in and then restructured it and wrote a lot more. Oh, okay. Said, hey, we need to add more here, add more this, you know, this and that kind of stuff and kind of worked well together. I haven't had any situations to where butt head was anybody yet. So, which is good, but What's yeah, so I kind of find a good, good way to work with people usually. That's nice. I was going to say, because I imagined with things like that, it would just be someone sat there, like Tom was saying, you go, and then I did this, and then I did this, and then I did this. It's like, slow down, I can only write so well, fast. It, <laughs> it's super hard doing a biography. Like, like I love the what the biographies are when they're done and, the, and like, the things I've gotten to do because of biographies. But doing them is really hard because a lot of times it's literally, someone will say, um, especially when, when they're not writing, I'm, I'm just the biographer totally, and they're just telling me their story. A lot of it is, like, Oh, and then I walked into the room and I saw this and I'm like, okay. And I have to turn that into four pages, you know, like just like this one little antidote. I have to figure out, okay. And I have to research where it was, you know, what the, what the place looked like at that decade. And then try to put in like, you know, like when I walked in, I smelled the brassy smell of, you know, whatever, and try to make it into a story because, you know, in reality, all it was, you know, not all as it was, but, you know, I'm trying to bring the reader to feel what it was. When they're telling me just, you know, I walked into the room, X, Y, Z happened, walked out. And I have to add in all of that stuff and do research and stuff. So it's when I do biographies, it's work. You know, it's literally mm-hmm. research, figuring this out, trying to figure this out. When I do fiction, it's fun for me because then it's just I don't have to do it. I just go, you know, just keep letting go and stuff. <laughs> 
I don't suppose they're both like really creatively fulfilling in very different ways. What's that? I suppose they're both like writing fiction and biographies, although they're essentially writing a book. I bet, I bet they're both creatively fulfilling in different ways. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're they're the same thing, but very different. Yeah. So you know, in the end, you you have a book. You know, you have a book mm-hmm. at the end. You know, and so it's still the same kind of thing. And, you know, and the the cool thing with biographies is that people connect to them more because they're they're a real life story, and they, they'll be able to talk to either me or to the, the subject of the book and be like, oh my God, I, you know, my cousin went through the same thing or I did, you know, this happened to me. And, you know, they, they kind of have a lot more deeper connection than, than fiction. Obviously fiction and people enjoy and can connect with it. Hmm. But when people know it's a true story and can connect more, it kind of has a little bit more of a, a bond and stuff. I like the idea when you're doing arm candy, if you're going like, so then I drove him around there. Did he pull his teeth out? Uh, n- n- no, no, we just went to an award <laughs> ceremony. Then he chopped his leg off. Was there a bag? I know I saw one. <laughs> and it did have a severed hand. No way. <laughs> <laughs> really? I knew it. <laughs> so, I suppose we had better talk about the hockey mask machete wielding elephant in the room. Yeah. So you've had a great working relationship with Jason Voorhees himself, Kane Hodder, mm-hmm. writing yep. three books of Kane. Did you know each other before working on Unmasked or did you meet when working on the book? Nope, not at all. Um, just growing up, I was a huge you know, horror fan, like I said. Um, I had little Jason figures of all Kane's movies. You know, I had the Uber Jason and all those in my dorm room, which which always looked weird when girls come over and just look at all my monster and horror figures. They're like, I'm going to get killed, you know? Um, <laughs> so I always had, uh, you know, I was a huge horror fan and I just started my writing career. I had like one or two books out or three books out about that time. And I took a break from writing one day and I watched um, a horror movie and it was Ed Gein, um, which Kane, Kane plays Ed Gein in the movie. Mm. And there's a scene in it where he has his shirt off um, and he had burn scars all over his body. And I was like, oh, those are real. And I'm like, I remember hearing something about that. And so I looked it up and I was like trying to find the story. I'm like, I wonder if he has a biography. And I looked and I found that he didn't. And I was like, I'm going to write him a proposal. Random stupid idea in my head. Never did a biography before. I was like, I'm just going to write a proposal. So I put together a little proposal, found a a contact online and I sent it to him. Never thought anything of it. I was like, yeah, that's never going to happen. But whatever. It was fun. And then all of a sudden, one night at 10 o'clock at night, because he, he was in a different time zone, um, my phone rings from a block number. And I'm like, so I answered. He's like, Mike, this is Kane Hodder. I go, OK. <laughs> and he was just like, no, this is Kane Hodder. I go, uh, what? Uh, yes. Hi. What? And like, my wife's and I go, you know, I'm like freaking out. I'm like, uh, yeah, what's going on? You know, I was like trying to like act normal. And so he, <laughs> he liked my proposal. Um, he had offers from from big publishers at the time. Um, but he was really worried about um, being uh, kind of sanitized because he's very crass and he's, you know, and he didn't, he read some other of his friends' biographies at the time and they were kind of just like, and then I did this with this celebrity and they were kind of like very just like, hey, name dropping and this and that. Mm. Um, and he didn't want that. And I said, look, I said, this book will not come out until you are 100% happy with the content, you know, this and that. And so he's like, okay. And so we went back and forth for a while. He agreed to do the book. Um, and then the first time I ever met him was to start working on the book. We met up in uh, uh, Lake George. He was doing a ghost hunt type of thing. And we met and we just hit it off and became incredible friends. And we're still, oh my God, I'm like looking over here like there's a calendar. There's nothing. Um, and then like <laughs> 13 years later now, we're, we're, you know, we're basically best friends to where, you know, we still talk, you know, on a regular basis. We hang out whenever we can and stuff and, you know, and, He's, you know, talks to my wife and my kids all the time. He's just kind of part of the family. So it's kind of a, it was a weird journey of a complete stranger, took a chance doing a pitch. And then, you know, we've had a crazy relationship, you know. I love the way life works sometimes. Like, yeah. It's just incredible, yeah. isn't it? It's, funnily enough, and I, I'm so sorry to just bring this on to me for one second. <laughs> but the same, I interviewed someone three, interviewed someone three years ago who I like worshipped growing up. And now we're best friends. It's really uh-huh. weird, isn't it? How like... Yeah. Yeah, how it just yeah, because not for a split second were you there going. <laughs> it's obviously Kane Hodder right here, so yeah, yeah. just bear me one moment, you know, Kane Hodder. Kane well, it, Hodder yeah, it's funny because like I've now worked, I've either met, worked with, or hung out with every horror star there is, pretty much, and 
you know, knowing like having some of them on my speed dial. And like every once in a while, I have to stop and go, wait a minute. I just talked to, you know, Tom Savini today. I talked to Kane Hodder today. I talked to this person, just, you know, emails, this and that. I'm like, holy crap. If my like 20 year old <laughs> self, you know, if it like would have died, there was actually the first horror convention I ever went to. Um, I had my Crystal Lake Memories book, which is a big, you know, the complete edition of the Friday 13th stuff. And there was four Jasons there and I got them to sign all the books. And I'm like freaking out. This is like the greatest day of my life. And I literally turned to my wife, uh, like before we left, and I just said, if I could just meet Kane Hodder, I'll die happy. Like, like just that, just meet him. And then, you know, then I'm like, and then like 10 years later, I'm like, ah, oh, Kane's gone. Like what? You know, like, you know, like, a weird kind of, you know, story of going from, you know, like literally going to die just to meet him to like, oh yeah, yeah Kane's hanging out in the house, you know, like, it was just so weird. Crazy. This way you tell us you still haven't gotten to sign that book. Yeah, yeah. Actually, no, I did. I did get him signed. I was like, I was like, wait a second. I think when Michael, I you ever, started it, he did it. Have you ever thought of a career in comedy? Just, just asking. I, I like doing uh, like improv goofy stuff. I always wanted to, but I'm too, too anxious of a person, too much, uh, too so much really? social anxiety and panic to do things like that. But, but I always oh, wanted to get that. Sorry, it's just, just the vibe I'm getting off you from everything that we've <laughs> talked about. Stuff like that. I'm just like, you are one hilarious dude. Like, I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I am very, it. very goofy. Yes. I love it. But <laughs> it brings me on to my next question. Um, I watched you try and hand feed a lion. Yes. <laughs> now, <laughs> the part before said you were attacked by an elk. It's a good yeah. job they weren't the other way around. That's for starters. Yes, but, oh my God. <laughs> I wouldn't be here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that lion was hungry. Oh my, I am not surprised you absolutely capped yourself trying to give it, ch- is it chicken? So, was it some sort of meat? They were frozen chicken legs, yeah, because they like to chew on them, I guess. The, <gasps> so the, the funny thing with that is, is we went to this amazing animal sanctuary, um, me and Kane, uh, and we we're on the book tour and we we're just filming what we did. And they let us literally go in the cages with animals, do all kinds of stuff. And it's a really cool place to where, um, you know, they saved animals that were people tried to take as pets. Like actually the the tigers there, I think the tigers were Mike Tyson's. They were Mike Tyson's old tigers that he had. Um, yeah, exactly. Because, you know, he wasn't allowed to keep them or whatever. But um, it was the only time that Kane is the toughest human I've ever met in my life. Like we've walked through haunted houses and he just walks through and he's like, nah, that's cool. <laughs> nothing phases him and that was the only time i ever saw him go holy crap because when that when those tigers stand up they're freaking they're 10 feet tall so i'm, I'm six two you know and kane's same height as me and the freaking tigers are towering over this with the paws the size of our heads and we're like oh my god you know like and getting that close to it, it's like oh and it's like you're trying to hand it to it and you're like oh god you know, you're gonna kill you know just, it's terrifying, but but amazing experience, you know, to be that close to them, you know. Yeah, but what blows my mind even further is somebody wanted that lion as a pet, Michael. Someone wanted to exactly. keep that lion in their house. Exactly, and that's the whole point of the, like those sanctuaries is to say, hey, look at these aren't pets, you know, like don't no. do this. You know? And it's sad no. how many how many sanctuaries are like that around there that people take in these animals that people are like, oh yeah, I'm gonna love this thing, you know, just dumb. Yeah. Oh, massively. Yeah. Oh, look at this little lion. Come look how cute it is. Yeah. Give it a give it a couple of years, and then we'll see how cute it is. Then, yeah. <laughs> we had a if you're around to tell us. Yeah, we had a guy two years ago around here who uh, he had a pet alligator, and it got out one day, and people were like, "Why is there an alligator?" Yeah, and it's like he's like, "I love it. You can't take it away from me." It's like alligator. You know, it's like it's like <laughs> what the fuck. Yeah. You might love it, but it's looking at you going, "Oh, God, I'm starving." <laughs> Yeah, he's like, just yeah. feed me. You don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't feed me. I'm gonna eat you. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. feed me. You. Relationship I eat you. you. <laughs> <laughs> it's that story of that anaconda, isn't there? Someone kept like a massive anaconda or something, and it wouldn't eat anything. Like it starved itself for ages, and basically it was trying to stretch itself out so it could eat her. <laughs> Get ready. That's gonna be a good meal. You know? <laughs> <laughs> This lady thinks we're friends. No, she didn't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Be nice until it's ready. You know. <laughs> Eat more Oreos. Here you go. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Not nedging those over. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Snake just passing the snacks. Yeah. I don't want you eat it. You eat it. Honestly, it's fine. Nah. <laughs> I'm watching what I eat at the minute. <laughs> 
But and as we just mentioned then, but with feeding the, the lions and whatnot, I love the fact that you wrote this book with Kane and then we're like, let's go on a book tour. Actually, I'm going to write, we're going to write about the book tour as well. Yeah. So, so what happened originally was Kane, we're it's complete opposites. So where Kane is, I mean, he's literally jumped out of a moving helicopter onto a moving train. Like, I don't think you can get, what? yeah, exactly. Like, I don't think you can get more insane than that. Like, that is the craziest stuff. And they had to do it like five times in the movie when they filmed it. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm like, I'm scared of my shadow type of person. So I'm like, ah, you know, no matter what it is, I'm scared of it. And so we just have this crazy odd couple relationship. And he's nuts. Like, he's he's awesome, but he's nuts. Like, he'll do anything to make someone laugh or just to make them get scared. Like, I've seen him, like, we were at a place once and there was a phone at a convention behind him and the phone rings and he just rips the phone off the wall and hands it to somebody, you know, and it's just like, <laughs> you just rip the phone off the wall. But, you know, he's Kane Hodder, so he gets away with it. But like, so we had this odd couple relationship yeah, to where um, we were always doing just weird, funny things. And so I started a blog, keeping fans up to date about writing the book. And the blog was read in 50 countries a week. So I was like, you know what, let's release it as a book. So we released it as a book, and then we were going to uh, do the book tour. I'm like, you know what? Let's just bring a camera guy with us. We'll film, we'll film whatever crazy stuff that we're going to do in each town. Um, and so that became the TV show. And then I wrote a, a, another book about the, uh, you know, the the whole tour and all the different things we did. And so we've had many, many adventures together. So it's been a little crazy. That's insane. For people listening to this, though, who who have no idea what a road trip with Kane Hodden was look like, apart from feeding lions, what other sort of stuff did you he make you do? Uh, I mean, we did everything from uh, we would do like competitions where we played uh, Kegel, some bowling in Germany. I think it's called Kegel or something like that. And we bet each other hit someone had to eat uh, liver type of thing. And then we broke into a castle in Germany, which scared the crap out of me. Breaking into a castle, it was closed, and we broke into an old castle in Germany. Probably could have got arrested. Um, we shot machine guns, um, like because I've never touched guns before, and he made me go to a, a gun range and we shot all kinds of machine guns. We drove dune buggies through the desert, um, in in Nevada. Uh, we went to an ice bar to where it was 30 below, and we dared each other to see who can go the longest without wearing the coats and gloves that you're supposed to wear, and then broke broke ice glasses on our heads, and uh, all kinds of crazy, weird things throughout their our adventures. And you just wanted to meet him that one time. Exactly. All I wanted was the one autograph. And I'm getting slammed and attacked by elk and things broken on my head. I can't help but think, though, you've done all these things. And part of me's like, why would you do that? And I'm like, hey, yeah, Kane Hodder told you to. That's why you do it. Well, but- it's funny because I always I always say that to my wife because she's like, you don't do things like that. I know. I'm like, I know, but Kane, Kane wanted me to do it. And she's like, so? And I'm like, yeah, you know. <laughs> Is there anything you actually did say no to? Uh, I don't know. There, there has to be somewhere. There has to be something. I mean, the only thing he doesn't, he's never getting me to do is drink. I've never drank alcohol in my life. And so every time, my entire time we go, everywhere we go, he's like, Mike, come on, you got to drink a drink for me. You got to have a drink for me. Come on, come on. That's the only thing I've never done. Was it was fair play. Yeah. Yeah, fair play. No, I admire that massively. I, mean, I really do, especially with the, with the alcohol just... culture. Uh, no, no reason. I just, I just never drank. I was a wuss as a cu- child, just scared to you know, do something wrong and drink, and it just became a a thing where I just never drank. Yeah, I'd probably have a be a lot more relaxed person if I did. <laughs> yeah. You know, but then I'd be like a really good writer because I'd be like that one, you know, the typewriter with the drink and the cigarette, and like yeah, I'd write five hundred stories, thinking it's really good, but like it's great. Yeah, <laughs> you wake up be like. It's literally just letters. I have no idea yeah, what it says. Uh... <laughs> so, I've had this idea. It's about a frog and a caterpillar. And they go to Disneyland, all right? And then basically, they, and then it's just like, like slur at the end. It's like, there's just like, the, 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 like this trails off. <laughs> yeah. Um, in 2009, you started your own publishing company uh, called AM Inc. and Dark Inc. Publishing. What made you want to want to start that? Uh, so I was, I was teaching a writing class, um, for adults and having gone to the master's program, there was so many things I was reading from, from students and, you know, people I went to the program with that I loved and I thought were awesome, but they weren't getting stuff published and, you know, and then looking into the industry, figuring out, you know, it's like, you know, obviously writing like books are an industry. They, They need to make money on things, you know? And so 
lots of times, even if something's good, it gets turned down just because they don't know what the market is or, you know, they don't think they'll make enough money on the book. And so I was like kind of fed up with that. And I was like, you know what? I want to start something to where the stories I like, we can put out and start and, you know, create things. Um, I was really naive by starting a company thinking, you know, I'm like, yeah, I'll just do this. Not realizing it would be, you know, encompass my entire life and be 13 years later now and doing, you know, we've done over a hundred different books, you know, with three Incredible. different imprints. Um, you know, it became something that was, was awesome for me. It's, it's very fulfilling to where, you know, I can help people become from going from a writer to a published author, uh, you know, and get to see our books all over the world and, you know, get, get awards and get all kinds of stuff done. Um, so it just came, became something I thought would be a cool idea and something like a fun hobby that turned into a, you know, a full-time awesome thing. Yeah. And I salute you for it massively. Thank you. Yeah. yeah it's it's awesome. You know, and get... I want to quit every other day, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's <laughs> rewarding. <laughs> but imagine though, that being a published author yourself to give other writers that opportunity to be published themselves. That's an incredible thing. Not only to exactly, do for yeah. you, but that must be feel amazing to give people that opportunity. <laughs> It is. It's cool. It's also good to crush people's souls when I say no. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like no. Yeah. <laughs> no I'm I'm oh, story um, idea. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like ha, ha, ha. I just started public coming just to turn people down. No, <laughs> no, no but it, it, it it is awesome, especially when you see you know you get to see someone sitting at a table and you know they have the book stacked up and there's people coming to them and you know and seeing them doing all kinds of stuff and it's like oh you know. I, you know, I helped them do that and get there, which is really kind of a cool thing. Yeah. That's phenomenal. And then you said you've been teaching as well. You've been teaching. Yeah, yeah. I've always, I've always taught on, off and on. And, um, you know, as a writer, you always have to do something else usually. And so I teach filmmaking um, to, to high school students, which I, which I love. It's really kind of a, a fun thing. You know, we have a full, t full studio and all the state of the art equipment and get to show kids movies and stuff. But the cool thing, the fun part for me is where, I get to bring in all the celebrities I work with, you know, not, I'm not bring them in that often. I have a couple of times, but you know, I get to say like, Oh, by the way, when I work with this or do this and examples from the real world and, you know, bring it into the film stuff, which is really kind of fun and rewarding. And then it's kind of like, it's kind of like the, the writing to where <clears throat> getting to see that I helped a writer getting to see a student find an interest or go to college for it or something like that is really cool. Cause it's like, then I know, you know what, I hope that kid, you know, find their career path and, and start their life and stuff, which is really kind of a, a fun cool thing yeah the world needs more michael the world needs more michael i tell you thank you, thank you. you are an inspiration <laughs> sir thank you. thank you with that saying you know you're teaching kids filmmaking you're writing these amazing books which are getting incredible reviews you know they are amazing stories thank you did were you ever tempted to go back to that original career path and go let's write a movie so i've, I've written several scripts um i've had one that was almost picked up during the pandemic uh, right before the pandemic um based on uh tales from mortician one of the first uh, michael gore books and <clears throat> we had it really close to getting picked up and then the pandemic hit and then it kind of just got all pushed back and pushed back and we never went back to it so my ultimate dream is to have a couple movies made after my book someday so i'll get back to it eventually but time is very small when you have teaching children and a company and all kinds of stuff. And it's just a, you know, constant chasing of things, but hopefully I'll get back to, you know, getting just some screenplays out there and, and done stuff. Yeah. What you told us about Mr. Blue Stick, that sounds like it'd be an amazing film. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I actually, that I have, cause I have sticky notes all over my desktop and like my writing plan for the year, actually Mr. Blue Stick for a script is on there. So whether that gets done, I don't know, but that's, that's like the goal for this year. You know? <laughs> Yeah. So, so most people have like a to-do list. You've got sticky notes around your monitor, just like yeah, oh, yeah. Well, of sticky notes, like 2023 writing plan. You know, has like what books I have to finish, what things I got to do. You know, yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> just, just quickly going back to your publishing company, I realized. Yeah. Do you focus on any like specific genres or books with the company, or is it just like whoever <laughs> wants whatever? So, so we have three three imprints. So we have AM Inc which is our children's books, um, some novels and short story collections, uh, like mainstream ones, and then um, a couple of mainstream biographies. And then Dark Inc., which is our biggest one, is all horror or dark-based books. Um, like we, we just started to do some dark crime books. Um, and so those are kind of horror, all of our horror stuff. 
And then we have Spooky Ink, which is um, children's like children's books that are kind of like monster themed and creepy things, which I love that kind of stuff. Um, so we kind of cover a lot of stuff. We don't do poetry or romance or history books or military based books, um, but we do basically anything in horror, um, a lot of kids books and then some mainstream kind of books. So we kind of have our kind of have our three that we work with. I love that. It's like the complete opposite side of the spectrum. Isn't it? Kids books, horror books. <laughs> yeah, it's a, yeah, it is fun. That's why we had to have the different imprints, you know. But it's funny we only have like, you know, like one one page for like social media stuff. So it's like one day it's like a bloody book cover, and then you know, fluffy kittens. You know, it's a little. <laughs> we probably need to separate that at some point, but you know. <laughs> have you ever wanted to write a story a bit more close to home, like involve maybe your family and make it a bit more personal without making it about the family? That makes sense. Am I making sense? Um, no, yeah, I was saying so. It's funny because there's there's different types of writers to where, first of all, as a writer, no matter what, if someone knows you and they read your book, every single time they're going to go, that's Charlie, isn't it? it right, <laughs> right, Charlie, right? And it, you know, so no matter what, people who know you are automatically going to think um, <clears throat> that it's someone or personal or whatever. So I know some writers who literally every single thing in their books is either something they experienced or people that they, you know, have worked with or known or something like that. Um, and then I'm the type of writer to where everything is just 100% fake. I just literally make up everybody, make up everything. <clears throat> very, very, very rarely will I ever, like, take a trait from somebody or do something like that. <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't really want to bring the real world into my fake no, stuff. You know, I, obviously, when I do some nonfiction of my own, then it's all about me but you know with the fiction i kind of just like keep it in my own fantasy world of you know fake kind of stuff no fair i mean no, no absolutely is there any bit of point though when you've been writing stories where you've finished it and then gone back and gone oh actually i might tweak oh actually i don't know if i like that part oh actually but then you get oh, to yeah. a point where you start to over adapt it i suppose so my my weakest point as a writer is the editing so like i have because i have so many stories in my head that I just want to get them out. And as soon as I finish writing the story, I don't want to ever look at it again. Like it's just, it's <laughs> out of my head, done. Like, like if that would be my ideal life to where I could finish it, not even read it again and just hand it off to someone. That Like that would be my goal. You know, like hire just like 10 editors, like take it, go do something with it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so w when you finish though, you know, I always go back and I'll read it and tweak sentences and lines and change things. Or like, oh, this doesn't work, fix it and stuff. Um, but I'm not a heavy rewriter or heavy editor. Like there's some, uh, there's Jeffrey Devers, one of my favorite uh, crime thriller guys. And he says, supposedly, which I don't understand how he does it. Every book, he'll write the whole book. And then he gets rid of 90% of the book and rewrites it. And I'm just huh? like, yeah, I'm just like, that's just a waste you know, of time. <laughs> you know, like, why would you waste your time? But that that's supposedly what he does. Obviously, he's, you know, worth $500 million or whatever. But still, so it works for him. But, you know, for me, it's like, I just want to get it out and then I'll read it over, clean it up a little bit. But yeah, I've never gotten to that cycle of redoing it, redoing it, because I'm always want to get on to the next thing. That's crazy. What if he writes a number one bestseller and doesn't realize it? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like the, my, my theory with, there's so many people I know who are writers who like, they've written like, like five novels and never published any of them or stories and this and that. My whole thing is like, it's like being a chef and you just cook food and go, Dump it in the trash and like, like someone yeah. could eat it, whether it tastes good or not, someone could eat it, you know, so why let it, you know, why let it go to waste, you know, use it for something, clean it up, put it out there. Even if you just self publish it, put it somewhere small, use it, you know, put it out there, you know? Yeah. Cause then surely you could just destroy the original and then rewrite what he does anyway, but having yeah. released the original. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, I, I don't use, know, it use it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You said that, but I noticed on, I believe it was on Amazon. I noticed it, Mister. Why is the name gone out of my head? We've only just Blue discussed Stick. it, Mister. Blooster. That's it. Did you release it twice? Because I saw you re-released it. Yeah. So, so when I first did those books, they were they were self-published when I was like early twenties. I put them out there, and then so my company picked them back up and put them back out. Like I don't know, like eight years ago or something like that, with new covers and you know, put them out in a fresh fresh book with a cleanly edited and stuff like that, kind of kind of retaken and put them back out. I was going to say, did you go back to it, make any changes? Or are you just like, nope, this is it. So I, I did a little bit. Like I read through and I cleaned it a little bit. And 
it was hard because I like part of me really wanted to go back and kind of gut it and redo it and this and that. Then I was like, you know what? I want to kind of just leave it. It was this is what I wrote at the time, and I kind of wanted to just like leave it as that. And I actually put a there's a little note in in the front of the book from me about that kind of saying, you know, this is a you know reprint of the book, blah blah blah, and and how I didn't want to change it. Um, I still think it's one of my best books, the story wise. You know, so I didn't want to gut it. Like I actually have. I wrote, because I write a lot, I wrote five (laughs) novels um, in my mid-20s, back before I had children, before I had anything to do, I wrote five (laughs) novels that I never did anything with. They're all just sitting there. And so I decided this year on my to-do list um, (laughs) to go back and try to finally clean those up and put them out. And I'm finding that I'm enjoying it, but my writing was different, obviously, back then. It was 15, oh my God, almost 20 years ago now. You know, so it was different and I'm kind of struggling with like, do I rewrite the entire thing or do I just kind of clean it up and it is what it is and I put it out. So I'm kind of kind of going back trying to figure that out with it, which is a little a little weird. But, you know, it's it's hopefully they'll all come out eventually. and They'll be good. You mentioned um, that Mr. Blue is going to be translated to Danish. Now, mm-hmm. we spoke to an author last year who had one of his books translated to Colombian, I think, or Spanish. And it was not the correct story. It was like something completely different. People were like, this is shit. This is this is awful because it's been mistranslated or whatever. Have you ever had that? Or does that ever concern uh, you? <laughs> so I I mean, well, obviously that would suck, yeah. But um <laughs> uh I mean the translations are new to me. Like I have uh actually over here, um Tom Savini's amazing biography. Oh. Uh this this is actually the Brazil edition. Um, which was translated into Portuguese, which I didn't know they spoke Portuguese in Brazil. Um, but this is the yeah, exactly. This is the the Portuguese language edition. But I'll never know if it's bad because I don't read it, you know. But it it looks pretty faithful, you know. So so part of me like does worry about it, but at the same time, I wouldn't know unless there's really bad reviews, you know, that say you know it's horrible and stuff. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of a, it's a concern, but hopefully I just got to trust the publishers that they're going to do a good job and, and get it out. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure they will. I didn't mean to put that down in your mind, Michael. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, now I'm like, oh God, I can't. <laughs> like, I'm going to learn Portuguese like I haven't slept now, in a month now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love yeah, the have... fact you own a copy. You could never read it to know, but it's like, well, hey, it's, my name's my on that. I'm having piece, it. So this, this will go on the shelf, you know, like nice little display piece. I love it. They did a really cool cover because they did like the. You know the uh, creep show classic. Oh, you know, awesome. Got a cover. Yeah, I think it's a really cool. They, like every every page of it's like you know super designed and like you know really cool. His name and stuff. And, yeah, That's so awesome. My name's yeah. on there. There's my name. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. So I always want to keep you know a library of all the things I've done. So that must have been amazing to work with with Tom as well. It is. Yeah. I mean, it's. It was one of those things to where, you know, I'm sitting in his kitchen in his house, and then all of a sudden he realized I'm like, I'm in, I'm in Tom Savini's house, just hanging out. You know, it's like it's just like a, like a holy crap, like this is this is weird kind of thing, you know, because you know Savini is like literally, you know, one of the biggest gods of all time when it comes to horror, you know, and his house is literally the greatest place in the history of the world. Um, <laughs> It, it, it is. It's he's lived in the same house for sixty years, uh, or he's seventy. Seventy years since he was born, lived in the same house. Um, wow. But wow. every inch of every room is memorabilia of things, and it's not just him. He's just a massive horror fan or movie fan and horror fan. And so, like, there's skulls in one room and thrones in another room, and like life size figures in another room. His whole bedroom is like action figures, and like he has all the heads from Dawn of the Dead around the, his bedroom. And like, just, you know, he has like a movie theater room, a game room, just tons, like every inch. I'm like, Tom, is that? He's like, oh yeah, those are the monkey from Monkey Shines. I'm like, oh my God. Okay. You know, like he just, he picks it. Like one day he's like going through a stack of stuff. We're trying to look for stuff for the book. He's like, oh, look at this. And I'm like, what is it? He goes, oh, that's the original uh, script from Creepshow with all my notes. And I'm like, and there's like handwritten notes from like, from like uh, Romero and like Stephen King on it. I'm like, Tom, Tom, do you realize this is worth a lot of money? He's like, oh, cool. Throws it in a pile. I'm like, oh, I'm like, <laughs> like holy crap. You know, it's like, it's just, it's like being in like the best horror memorabilia room in the world. It's like, oh, you know. Yeah. Go on, Jay. 
I was gonna say, I don't think I could imagine waking up in the middle of the night now and being surrounded by Dawn of the Dead zombie heads. That would freak oh, me yeah, the yeah, fuck every, out. Yeah. <laughs> he's got life size like it's a giant robot in his bedroom. There's like everything is it's so cool. It's it's like literally the biggest movie nerds like dream home. There's actually a, if you go on YouTube, there's a, I forgot the name of it, but if you type in Tom Savini like house tour, you can actually see there's like a whole a guy went over and did a whole tour of his house and all the things and stuff, which is really cool. And and his college, which is also a freaking amazing. That's awesome. Wow. That's awesome. Do you feel that horror, the horror genre or the horror movie genre is, has almost got to a point where it can't go any further? Because I like there's so many classics that you don't really hear about that much anymore. It's like, oh, my God, this new horror movie has been unbelievable, you know, and you don't really get classics anymore. Does that make sense? I, it's it's weird because I'm assuming we're close-ish in age, but like I, yeah. it, like, I can't imagine... Like like almost everything back then was so iconic and, and and legendary for us that I can't imagine someone like in thirty years being like, oh man, Conjuring is like <laughs> the greatest. I mean, it's an awesome movie and it's scary, but it, it just they don't have that sense of like like wonder anymore of like you know to where it's like, nope. man, we're gonna talk about this kind of movie, you know. And so so I, I feel like it's evolved into a different kind of thing, you know, to where it's yeah. just you know, different generation of it kind of, which it's still horror and it's still awesome, but it's, there was just something magical about the eighties and to, into the nineties kind of thing about it, you know? Cause they just obviously released the trailer for Scream 6. Sorry. And I was just like, Scream 6? Why? Hey, like, I think, I, I think Michael Myers has been around forever as well. <laughs> I, I, I Scream though is to me, I, I don't, I don't care if they make 105, I'll see them all. I love it. <laughs> that, was one, that was the one, the movie that kind of like really, like turned it for me to where like like I was really loving movie horror movies. And then I was 16 when it came out, and I went and saw it in the theater, and I was just like, you know, like whoa, you know, like like mind blown. I was like, this, you know, it kind of pushed me into the path of you know horror, you know. So um, I, I'll always give reason, it in my money. The reason I feel like horror now isn't as iconic is because you don't have those iconic characters anymore. Where's yeah, exactly. your Jason, your Freddy, your Michaels, your Pinhead, all the. Yep. There is none of them anymore. Yeah, yeah, and, and the the funny thing though is, and, like, I wanted to write an essay about it, and I was like, eh, I'm not gonna, I'm too lazy. But um, <laughs> it, it's the internet world now. Everyone wants to complain. Like, no matter what it is, people would rather they get so excited to complain rather than ever say something's good. And like, like we just got like like a, a new Texas Chainsaw Massacre last year. Not the greatest movie. But there's some amazing kills in it. It's still mm-hmm. Leatherface running around killing people. And there's nothing but hatred and this and that. And like, oh, the originals. Like, if you go back and watch the originals, they're not good movies. They're fun, but they're not high art. You know what I mean? Like, you're, you know, Texas Chainsaw 4 is ridiculous. You know, it's like they're not high art. And yet now, because we have these mouthpieces to where we can complain about everything constantly, I don't think we can bring these characters back to where they're going to be good films because no matter what we're going to constantly every person's going to be yelling going oh this is horrible this person sucks or this thing it's not a good anymore and it kind of like destroys that what you know that word of mouth that we had when we were kids to where we'd be on the playground or a school going yeah the new jason movie and I'm like what tell me about it you know it's now it's you have yeah. a, a a trailer telling you a trailer is going to come out tomorrow you know and then you have you know <laughs> you know like 500 <laughs> notifications and this and that like every you know and, the, and then we dissect the trailer. Then you have 500 YouTube videos going, okay, man, we're going to have a, a reaction to the trailer. You know, and then we like, <laughs> take it down to where, like, we can't just enjoy it anymore. It's just, like, becomes this, you know, like, we're going to so pick true. it apart until it's dead, you know? So it's true. So I can't true. stand <laughs> them reaction videos. I can't. Yeah, like you said, like, they, they pick every last bit apart. Oh, oh, they might have teased this. Do you know what? Yeah, exactly. Just wait for it to come out. <laughs> yeah. Just watch it's the movie. A- I'm Dwayne from Iowa, and basically what we're going to do right now is we're going to break this down. Exactly. Like, like, I have no experience in any of this. I have no degrees in any of this. I've never done anything. Yeah. Like, watch my video because I have nobody. You know, and it's like, but yet, <laughs> then they'll get 38 million views. I was gonna say, that's the worst you part. Know? They get like yeah. 6 million views. <laughs> that, that's what I And everybody else starts telling their friends. Yeah, I fight with my students all the time and my kids because they rather watch YouTube over anything. And I'm just like, oh my God, you're watching so many of these videos are just talentless people who are making horrible quality things and yet they're more famous than than movie stars now and i'm just like i don't get it i'm like they're literally just going oh, no. what's up guys it's me blah 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 you know and it's just like 
okay. Like any idiot could do that in 30 seconds. You know, it's just like, oh, I'm an old man now. I'm like, I'm just like, <laughs> darn kids, <laughs> get off my porch. <laughs> it's not as good as back in my day. <laughs> when I was a kid, we had to watch Jason in the movie theater. <laughs> uh, yep. We had to wait to find oh. out he went to space. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh, the good. final frontier. <laughs> oh, compose ourselves, right? So, so with with your publishing company, one last thing I wanted to ask about is: can people submit their work to you? If there's people listening to this who want to get their work out, there, can people submit their work? Yeah. Uh, so normally we're we're open for for anybody can submit. Um, we have the guidelines on the on the website that say you know um, what we take, what we don't take. Um, but we've for this this year for the first time we've actually have uh, open call windows now, so where you can only submit during certain periods. Only because we've gotten way too many submissions. I think there was one month where we had four hundred submissions in one month, and we're like, okay, we gotta, we, yeah, we gotta like <gasps> simmer this down. And we already have we got twenty. Uh, I'm looking at my screen, not just like randomly spaced. We got twenty. <laughs> uh, I think twenty four books in product in production right now. Um, <clears throat> so. There's a lot, so we're pretty full until 2024. So wow. there's certain windows, so people can submit, but they have to just check the windows of when they can submit and stuff. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. It's, it's amazing to see that that many people are like submitting their work, though. It's that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's awesome, and you know, but it also shows you how how hard it is, though, too, when you're a writer in the creative world to, to you know try to get that you know into that world there, break in. Yeah. So when I, when I was looking at some of the reviews of your books, as I was saying, there's, there's some amazing reviews out there, all sorts okay. of different ones. Like there was one comparing it to Silence, and one of the books comparing it to Silence of the Lambs. There's like incredible reviews out there. But if people listening to this wanted to check out one or two of your books, which ones would you recommend them to go check out? I know it's like asking <laughs> to pick a favorite child, but. <clears throat> well, it, it depends on what they like to read. So if they're not horror fans, then I would read Mr. Blusick or. Um, 50 handfuls. If they're horror fans, then I would read um, Pieces, which I think is my one of my favorites, or um, Skeletons in the Attic, which is all a collection of short stories. Um, kind of gory. So so if you're in the gorier side, like the Skeletons and Tales, um, if you want more of a dark crime and weird twisted stuff, the Pieces. <laughs> um, and then obviously if you're a horror movie fan, then like Kane's biography, you know, um, pick it up unmasked. So, so it just kind of depends on what you're what your uh, type is, you know, what kind of thing. So the one thing I hate more than anything is when, uh, like, because we'll do, like, book giveaways or do something, and then someone leaves a review and be like, I hated this book because I don't read horror. And it's like, so why did you read it? <laughs> like, I've got literally so many reviews like that to where it's like, I hate horror. This book sucks. It's like, so why did you pick this book up? You know, <laughs> like that kind of thing. Yeah. So Keyboard warriors. like. Absolute keyboard. That's like the people that complain about a festival lineup. Don't go yeah. then. Don't it's spend exactly. two hundred fifty-three. Like, yeah. But yeah, just don't go. I like, I don't... That week. Yeah. Mental people are crazy. This one, I just yeah. want to write for again. They're like they're like the YouTubers. Yeah. You know, like Dwayne from Iowa re reviewing Scream Six. <laughs> you know, it's just gonna. I'm gonna I write a review. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this book does suck. I don't like horror either. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Then why are you here? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I always find it funny too. It's like, you know, like you know, kind of grew up with the if you don't like something, you know, don't say anything, you know. And it's like, yeah. but with the internet, it's like, you know, I'd rather hate something. Like, you know, if you love something, most people don't leave a review. Like, oh, that was awesome. They don't leave the review. They like to leave reviews when they're angry. Like, I hated yeah. this. You know, like if you go and like Yelp <laughs> reviews, you know, things like that. It's almost always just because they're angry. Because no one goes on there when they're happy to leave reviews. You know. I wish I'd give this negative stars. <laughs> yeah, like, oh. If I could give it zero, I would. <laughs> yeah. oh. Before we start wrapping up, though, is there anything you're working on that you can talk about? Anything you've got coming up that you need, you're needing to promote or anything like that? Uh, so I have uh, Do Not Open, which is the third in the uh, my Michael Gore horror short story series coming out. And I think it's March. There's no set date yet, but I think it's around March coming out. Um, I have a really big book. It's the biggest book I ever wrote um, coming out in August. 
uh, but I'm not allowed to talk about it yet um, because it's it's actually a huge book with Simon and Schuster, which is you know one of the biggest publishers wow. in the world. Yeah, so I'm not allowed to talk about it, but it's another uh, celebrity biography, which is which I'm excited about, um, and that'll come out in August. So that'll be a huge deal for me. So so that's kind of what I'm working on now, and then playing out the next books as I as I get going. Just knocking off them post-it notes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Incredible. Mr. Stevens, do you have any more questions for our wonderful guest? I do. When you were obviously growing up hating horror and not reading anything, did you ever think <laughs> that going through, you know, to film, writing school and everything, becoming basically he was today, like writing all your stories, hanging out with the biggest horror stars in the world and that sort of thing, did you ever think that would ever happen growing up? Uh, you know, when I was nine, I said, you know what, one day I'm going to be a, a huge author. No, I'm just <laughs> uh, no, I mean, you know, I was just a, uh, I was a, uh, I won't say a dumb little kid, but you know, I was like that little kid who, like, I remember I failed high school freshman English. You know, I got a forty-seven in English. You know, and I never, you know, never kind of really looked to the future. I just had no plan, and and something just clicked when I got into college to where you know everything changed. But yeah, I never, never would have thought it when I was a kid that I would be a writer. And, and I guarantee, if you ask anyone in my life at that time. They'd be like, that kid writing? <laughs> so, you know, like I was in, you know, I was in the remedial, remedial English classes when I was in elementary school. So those teachers would have been like, mm, nah, this kid'd be lucky if he reads a book, you know. So, <laughs> which is why no, I don't like... judge that's why I don't judge kids though, you know what I mean? Because you never know when you get that slack or like actually you no, know, which uh, I don't know if I can say, eh. Okay, so I'll say when I was in film school, um, I was like the super studious guy. I was like, I was there 15 minutes before class. You know, I was the one doing all my work, you know, like constantly on top of everything. And then there was this group of, of like five guys who would come in because the classes were three hour long classes. And these kids would stroll in high as a kite, like five or like an hour into class, you know, this and that. They would slack off, hardly do anything. And I'd be up in the front of the room going, <laughs> you know, like all like, whatever, guys, I'm doing my work. Those are the ones who all became famous. They literally, no way. Every, every, like all one of them. But I don't want to. I won't say. I just won't reveal because I'm not going. I don't want to say that they were the horrible slacker kids. But uh, yeah, a couple <laughs> of them end up having their own TV show for ten years. Um, another one is a very famous director. Um, another one became a big producer, and another one was an actor. So yeah, they, all of them, the kids who I was like, huh, how, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> all became famous and i'm like damn it <laughs> i'm like so I, I, don't try not to judge people. Fuck. <laughs> I don't judge people anymore you know because i'm like you know what we don't know what that kid's gonna be you know you it's know? kind of amazing as well at the same in the same time like yeah I, I, I can't put it into words i think that's i think that's like weirdly incredible do you know what i mean yeah, yeah. like never mother like oh my <laughs> dad like you absolute ah but also <laughs> Sure, yeah, but, don't, don't no, I'm I won't say that. <laughs> don't don't try hard, kids. Don't try hard at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. oh, this has been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for joining us and doing this. Thank you. This is fun. Before we let you get out of here, though, any plugs, social medias, anything you want people to go check out? Uh, just authormike.com is all my my books and my upcoming appearances. I got a, I'm, I'm booking all my conventions for the year and, and different appearances. Um, Kane was just offered England, but I think he's turning it down, uh, which I should talk him into. Be like, let's go, let's go do it, you know. Yes. Yeah, so all my appearances around there. Um, I post a TikTok every day, which is just uh, I think it's author Mike is still my TikTok as well. Um, but yeah, I post a TikTok every day, and uh, yeah, so find me on TikTok and go on there, and that's me. I think you should definitely find a job in comedy as well <laughs> if you can fit it in with everything else. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. I'll have a fourth job. We'll put it on there. Yeah. Add it to the post-it notes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do comedy now. <laughs> um, and then I go up and I bomb and I'm like, I hate those guys. They told me to do it. I quit it. <laughs> Fucking Brits. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> Their um, humor over there is so different than ours. <laughs> okay, we've got to go to the UK so you can kick their ass for me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, Michael, this has been great. This is, I've had so much fun. This has been absolutely <laughs> fantastic. fantastic. You've been a hero. Enjoy your evening, sir. Thank you so much oh, for your you time. Too. This is great. Thanks, guys. Great. Take Thank care, you Michael. So Take care, man. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye. What an incredible conversation. So much fun. It's 
we we've set the bar high for already and we're only in january what a great interview that is absolutely incredible anyone that says they get their love from horror from one simple thing and that be boobs is an absolute legend in my eyes <laughs> michael thank you so much again we really appreciate you taking the time to sit and chat to us we thoroughly enjoyed it and we hope that you guys enjoyed listening to it as much as we did recording it <laughs>